Okay, good evening, folks. Uh, welcome to our November meeting of the Shrewsbury Historical Society. Um, we've got a great program lined up for you tonight. Before we start, I want to uh, I mention that I have some, I'm sure you know, I have some sad news to relay to you that Dorby Thomas, longtime member, board of director, past president, passed away on Friday, November 11th. Um, could we please have a moment of silence for Dorby? Thank you. Um, could we have a short curator's report tonight? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Treasurer's report, Ann. Okay, thanks very much. And now for our program tonight. Now for my little lead up. According to the CDC, the Spanish influenza pandemic of 1918, 1990, 1919, 50 million people died worldwide. There were more than 20 deaths in Shrewsbury. Ten of those people are buried in Mountain View Cemetery. 
Our speaker tonight on the Shrewsbury and the 1918-1919 influenza pandemic is Maura Miller. Good evening. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak on this topic this evening. Um, I, I apologize for standing back here, but I have this uh, same presentation on my laptop with notes, so I may have to refer to them, and, and that's why I'm not sort of going to do more walking around amongst you. But first and foremost, I have to tell you well, right up front, there is no way, shape, or form that I am an expert on influenza or pandemics. <laughs> I solely I became interested in this topic um, walking through Mountain View Cemetery. I frequently walk through the cemetery. I'm a genealogist. Uh, I love cemeteries and, and looking at uh, gravestones. And one uh, particular morning, I came across the, the grave marker for a woman who died in Shrewsbury. I noticed that she was a young woman in her 20s, died in 1918. And I did know a little bit about the time. I knew that there had been a, um, a, a flu that occurred during the, uh, World War I, and that particular flu had been uh, particularly devastating to young people. So I went home and I looked her up, found out, sure enough, she had died from, from influenza. And then I did a little more research, and I started to find um, information and death certificates on uh, a number of other people from Shrewsbury who also died from influenza. And so that is what sort of sparked, it was the genesis of this topic and me being here um, with you this evening. So, so, you know, first to start, I guess, what is an influenza pandemic? I don't know um, if people are familiar with the term pandemic. We all know the flu, the grip, the flu, you know, we have a number of names that, that people call influenza. But a pandemic is an epidemic that goes worldwide. It affects people. Um, it spreads to a very large portion of the world population. And when it does that, it gets the name pandemic. Pandemics occur, uh, thankfully for us, irregularly. They're not a regular occurrence. But when they do occur, they are responsible for very high levels of, of mortality, or a lot of people die. In the past century, there have been three uh, influenza pandemics. The 1918, what was called the Spanish influenza, and in 1957 and 1968, the Asian uh, influenza. And uh, today, uh, obviously, we're focusing on 1918 and the Spanish flu. This has gone down in history as the most serious pandemic in recorded history. It's estimated to have infected a third of the world's population. It killed an estimated, it's somewhere between 20 million to 50 million, depending on, on what source you're looking at. And it was described as um, having spread with extraordinary ferocity and speed. Um, and 675,000 um, people in the United States um, were recorded as dying during this pandemic. I should mention, too, my primary focus, what I really want to get across tonight, is about the people. So I'm going to give you a little background. But um, uh, there are quite a few people, um, as, as, as Carl referenced, that, that actually died in Shrewsbury. So I'm going to go a little f quickly. Um, and so I will want to answer questions at the end. But if you can hold any questions until then, um, that would be great. I'd really ap yeah, appreciate it. So, OK. Um, so it, the origin of the 1918 pandemic is disputed um, amongst historians. But they all uh, agree that it was conditions uh, based in World War I uh, that contributed to the high rates of mortality. Uh, many of the victims were young, and they were otherwise healthy adults. So as opposed to today, flu typically um, is not somebody, young people um, may get the flu, especially if they don't get a flu shot. Um, but it's not usually um, results in, in the, the death rates that were seen in 1918. At the time, there were no effective drugs or vaccines available to treat it, to prevent it. Uh, and it was so deadly because it actually invaded the lungs, and it caused a severe form of pneumonia. And it's, the pneumonia uh, was the cause of, of people dying. Um, it, it spread quickly, as I said. So medical personnel and medical facilities, hospitals, et cetera, they were just very quickly overwhelmed. And the epidemic continued into 1990, 1919. But as you'll see, um, the number of deaths really began to decline around November of 1918, with its peak, a real spike, um, in October of that year. 
So this is a, um, a sorry, hang on, I'm not keeping myself up with my own with my own notes here. So this is a graphic that I, I downloaded from a site, the National Museum of Health and Medicine. I just thought it was interesting because it illustrates what I was just describing in that. Um, the influenza, this is showing America and Europe during that period, kind of started um, early in 1918 and then you see that big spike coming up around October, November and what you'll see here in Shrewsbury is, the sh is what happened here in Shrewsbury followed that, that, same, that same chart, that same graph and then it declined around November, December and then there was an, another little bump that had occurred in the early months of 1919. The picture on the right um, is an emergency military hospital that was set up during the epidemic uh, at a camp in, uh, uh, army camp I think it was, in Kansas. Uh, it's an interesting photo uh, because one of the theories of the origin of the flu was that it actually started in 1918 uh, in March of that year in Fort Riley, Kansas. 48 men died there at Fort Riley. And the theory was that they then carried, the men that didn't die, carried the disease over with them to the war in Europe where the virus uh, mutated and then came back to the United States with the, with the same soldiers, um, but it came back with a vengeance. That seems to be a prevailing theory amongst um, historians. So, go back up a little bit. What was the world like in 1918? So we're almost, we're approaching the 100 year anniversary of, um, of the flu pandemic. But in 1918, just to get a little sense of what it was like, World War I was still ongoing, it was still raging in Europe. The U.S. had entered the uh, war, which was called the Great War at that time. We now call it World War I. The U.S. Um, entered that conflict in 1917. Woodrow Wilson was our president. United States, uh, he had been re-elected in November of 1917. In March of 1918, that's when the Spanish uh, flu first emerged, and again, probably uh, somewhere in the United States. Interesting, just a little tidbit, um, it's when the U U.S. adopted daylight savings time, it was supposed to be a temporary measure for the war, we're still, we're still dealing with it now. Um, in July, Tsar Nicholas and the Romanov family, the famous Anastasia, they were murdered by the Bolsheviks. So in addition to World War I and everything going on, the Russian Revolution was going on around the, war, uh, around the world. M closer to home, in July of that year, a German U-boat had attacked merchant ves vessels off Cape Cod. I think it was off of Bourne. So the war was, was coming a little closer to the shores of, of uh, the United States. August, there was a second wave of the Spanish flu that, that showed up uh, in the U.S. Um, so it was a difficult time for people. I mean, the world was at war. There was revolution. Um, it just must have been, uh, I, I imagine, a time of great anxiety and, and fear for people. Uh, on the positive side, if you were in New England, the Red Sox won the World Series. Uh, as we know, it was the last time. Uh, that they, they won it until 2004 when they broke the curse, but, but I'm sure that was a very uplifting moment for people at the time. And then finally in November, on November 11th, 1918, the armistice, what we now call Armistice Day, the war officially ended. Okay. So uh, uh, just, just a lot going on, a very chaotic period in, in history. <clears throat> Excuse me, so bringing it closer to home, what was Shrewsbury like in 1918? Well, the population was somewhere around probably 2,800 people. The latest, num the, the numbers were from the 1915 census. So we're now around 36,000 people, right? So you can, it was a much, much smaller community. People had been focused on the war for the last four years. Um, the, according to the Selectman's report and the town clerk's report uh, from 1918, um, the activities uh, were around, uh, well first they reported that more than 100, as they referred to them, boys, had left town to join the military. Um, there were home guards had formed, they drilled regularly, they, they um, 
they had um, rifles and other military um, um, components that they drilled. I guess they were probably like we would, might call the National Guard now. But that was going on on a regular basis. People were involved with fundraising and all sorts of campaigns to, um, to sell Liberty Bonds and other funds to support the war. There were societies and committees needed hundreds of items. They produced articles for hospitals. Um, they were collecting things like um, garments and other supplies to send as war relief to other countries. So the people here were just very, very focused on supporting the troops and supporting uh, people who lived in some of these war torn areas. A total of six men died from Shrewsbury during uh, World War I. Five of them died in 1918. So again, um, people are were primary focus were trying to help in, in this period, uh, and then they were getting the news on, on a regular basis that another um, another boy, as they call him, another man um, from Shrewsbury, um, had had died in the conflict. And then again, November 11th, I can just imagine what a great day that was. Um, a kind of a relief. They got the official news here in Shrewsbury. They at the time they called it Victory Day. The war was over. Uh, and there was a notation in, um, in one of the reports that at 3.45 in the morning, the bell started clanging, clanging the church bell over at the Congregational Church. It awakened all the sleeping people. Uh, there was also a whistle that was blowing at the Green and Hickey Leather Factory, um, and which added a joyous note. So they woke everybody up at 4 a.m. in the morning to, um, to let them know that the war was over. Okay, um, so another a couple more uh, facts. Uh, September 1918, Camp Devons, we now know that as Fort Devons, um, was one of the main centers of the U.S. war effort. And Devons, Camp Devons now is described sort of as the ground zero of the flu pandemic, uh, the epicenter, if you will. Um, the epidemic not only here in Massachusetts but possibly throughout New England and, and on a broader scope. The reason was that the barracks there were crammed at the time, 45,000 soldiers uh, waiting to ship to France. Crowded conditions, you know, obviously made for a great breeding ground for, for the virus. The camp hospital must have already been very busy and then was very, very quickly overwhelmed with over 8,000 sick and dying soldiers. Some of the descriptions, um, not pleasant, but the, the extra bodies, the living and the dead, they had to stash them in halls and corridors and outlying buildings. So this very quickly, as I said, was, was got to something that was out of control and very difficult uh, for, the, for the medical personnel to handle. It rapidly spread the influenza throughout Worcester County, estimates of 1,000 to 2,000 people who died. Uh, by mid-September, the local newspapers began reporting cases of sickness and death. Um, and initially, they, um, th th there wasn't what I would describe as a great sense of urgency. I don't think they initially realized what, what, they, what was going on, how um, serious this was, or perhaps officials were trying to not uh, panic people. Uh, but the newspapers just started reporting um, gr gradually and then eventually more and more reports. Uh, schools, theaters, other public places were closed, closed, churches were closed. Teachers were asked to volunteer at hospitals to replace sick nurses. So again, you think the war was going over. A lot of the nurses had volunteered for the war effort and those who were left were some of the first to actually get sick with the influenza as they were waiting, as they were uh, caring for patients. Uh, there was also a need to very quickly establish an orphanage in Worcester and homes to care for children of six parents. So obviously orphanages because parents were dying from the influenza and then there were a number of children who needed care when their um, parents were sick. So again, it was a, it was a very uh, difficult situation. I just uh, did a few clippings from the um, newspapers at the time, the Worcester Telegram and the, uh, the Worcester Gazette, just to give you kind of a sense and a flavor for, for what, was, um, what was being reported. Um, here on the right, you can see this is very early, September 20th. Um, it talks about the greatest number of cases, about 6,500 being reported at Camp Devons. Uh, talks about initially they were diagnosed people with pneumonia, 
again, they hadn't yet made the link that the pneumonia was actually being caused or, or linked to influenza. Over here, uh, this is out of Boston on the same date. They're talking about the number of cases of death and influenza pneumonia showing up in Boston. And then it just note that the health authorities um, were confident at this point that the worst had passed, but it was just starting. Okay, I, I, again, not, not sure um, if, if they realized or they were just trying to underplay it a bit. Um, this uh, at the top, uh, this is talking about Worcester City Hospital was unable to care for um, influenza patients. Uh, blankets were being brought from Fort Devens uh, for the children's home that had been established uh, in Worcester. It was called Newton House. It was on Harvard Street. Uh, here's the article about the school teachers responding to help as emergency workers. On the bottom here, a little excerpt that talks about uh, there were 17, 75 patients being cared for at Worcester City Hospital. 25 of them were regular nurses, and four of those nurses were on the danger list. Um, just another report of how it's spreading um, throughout. This is Washington three days later on the 23rd. It's spreading now amongst army camps. Here in, Qu in Quincy, Mass, uh, th th you couldn't hold a public funeral because they didn't want people gathering in, in public places. Um, and then closer to home, this is Baldwinville, which is Templeton, which is up in northern Worcester County. An example of how it was starting to influence businesses. Forty workers in one shop at this company. Uh, we're out sick with influenza. And then this um, is uh, the uh, town clerk's report from 1918. George Stone was the town clerk at the time. And uh, this was how he opened the report for the clerk that year, uh, describing how the death record had been a remarkable one. While the town had a less severe death rate than other communities, from what he described as the scourge of the Spanish influenza and the accompanying pneumonia, there were in the month of October, whoops, 12 deaths from the epidemic. And so, if I don't knock down the furniture, I just quickly, I sort of graphed a little bit. Um, I'm going to begin talking about the people in Shrewsbury um, who were Im impacted by this, who the deaths were attributed to influenza, but just graphed out, and you can see that this graph, if you remember that one I showed um, from 1918-1919, uh, um, and how it had graphed, how it sort of started gradual, it peaked up in, in November. There were no deaths here in November, and then um, the influenza deaths continued uh, into um, early 1919, but certainly not with the severity that we were seeing in October of 1918. My goal in, <clears throat> excuse me, talking about the people who died from the influenza uh, is to, again, I'm a genealogist, so I'm interested in the people, uh, and I like to know a little bit about them and their lives. Who were these people um, that, that this, this disease, this illness claimed, and hopefully to bring, uh, bring a, tell you just a little bit about each of them and, um, you know, again, maybe sort of, um, you, you might know them, you might know somebody, but just to sort of uh, remember them in, in some capacity. I think many of them have been sort of lost to history. I focused on those people whose death certificates actually said that they died from influenza as a primary or secondary cause. The reason is that, as I said before, some early cases, people um, had pneumonia, they, they thought they had pneumonia. They hadn't made the link. So their death certificate may read pneumonia. So just for purposes of, of narrowing it a little bit, um, but also um, for, for being consistent, uh, I focused on the, them. And now having said that, I'm going to break that rule for the first person I'm going to talk about. <laughs> and I'll tell you, I'll tell you why. So you can see how early this is, September uh, 19, uh, September 20th, okay? So remember, that's when the reports were just sort of appearing. This is a, uh, a, a boy, a young man who was 16. He was a resident of Brooklyn, New York, but he died in Shrewsbury. Um, this information um, on all of these slides I have, the information in here is, is what I took off the, the actual death certificate. Uh, and so I wondered about him. I thought, well, well, who is he? What was he doing? He lived in Brooklyn, but he was in Shrewsbury. 
I couldn't really find any information, a whole lot of information about him. Um, and I was having a conversation with a resident in town, telling this person that I was going to speak at this um, forum. And the person said to me, you know, it's interesting. My family has a family story about a boy who visited from New York City and died from the flu. And I, so I said, oh, really? And we started talking about it. And I mentioned the name and started gathering some facts and eventually confirmed that this boy is the same one. This, he, he was Benjamin Herman. Resident prefers to remain anonymous, so that's why I'm not um, I'm not going into any further description. I'm going to tell the story that I was told, and you might understand why maybe they want some anonymity. Uh, but the family legend, the story is that this young man, Benjamin, uh, was sent to Shrewsbury because he was ill. Now, whether he had the flu or not, don't know, but that was the family story. Came here um, and, and then died from the flu. And at the time, um, it was people, they were trying to control the spread of the virus uh, and there was either concern or they were told that the body couldn't be transferred back to, couldn't be sent back to Brooklyn for burial. So the family came up with a solution and built a wooden crate for which Benjamin was placed in and sent via cargo on train back to Brooklyn. So that's the story of Benjamin Herman. It's the family legend. Don't know if that's, how much of that is family legend or truth, but again, it kind of describes it, what was going on in the time and maybe some desperate measures people took in order to, um, to care for their loved ones. So he may have been the first victim in Shrewsbury, even though his death certificate says, um, it doesn't say influenza, it says pneumonia. The first recorded victim that we know of is James Egan Conlon. And you may recognize James's name because his name is on the World War I memorial over in front of Beale School. As you can see, he was a private in the Army. Um, he served in a, um, a field bakery division. He was at Camp Devons. So there's the link between Shrewsbury and uh, what was called Ground Zero or Camp Devons. A little bit about James. Um, he, he, his residence was, was uh, recorded at South Quinsigamond Avenue, and that was where he died. Um, he's, he is, he's buried in Worcester. He was married only four months to Mary Shields. And you note that um, a daughter was born in 1919. So it's obvious that Mary was expecting the child at the time that James died. Um, the, this story, I, I was actually I was able to find an obituary for him. It's, it was rare to, to find one at the time. Uh, but you see, uh, th they talk about him. They talk about, um, you can see he died of pneumonia at the home of his mother-in-law, Bridget Shield. So that's, that's the connection to South Quinsigamond Avenue. Um, he, he had gone to school in Worcester. Uh, you know, it tells a little bit about him. Um, here, they describe how he had caught a cold a week ago at camp, being unable to form any of his duties. He obtained a leave of absence. He was sick. He came home and then became what they describe as violently ill at the home of his mother-in-law. He became worse. Pneumonia set in, and he died. All right. So sad, sad story. A lot of these are, but again, um, uh, a little bit about James Conlin. Uh, and, you know, his service to the country in here and, um, you know, unfortunately, um, this, this virus, the flu virus got him. The next um, individual is J. Edward Piper. He was the second um, reported case um, of individual to die from influenza here in Shrewsbury. Um, he died at, at a home on Lake Street. Uh, he was uh, originally from Millbury, and so um, they had a, a, mil a funeral, um, returned him to, to Millbury. James was married to uh, Emma Thompson. They had four children, were born uh, between 1912 and 1916. It's sad, uh, two of the daughters died in infancy, and so there were two sons. Um, oops, two sons left. Uh, and um, you can see in this, this 
brief description from the, the, the Worcester Gazette uh, that Mr. Piper left the children, uh, the wife and two children. Mrs. Piper is ill with pneumonia and is cared for by her sister. The two children are also sick. That was not an unusual story. I spent a lot of time going through the Worcester newspapers of the time and that was quite common and again it ties back to that they, they had to or open orphanages and homes to care for children. Uh, I did not, since I did not find any other Pipers uh, in, in this research, my, my hope for them is that they recovered and they all lived long, very happy lives, um, you know, into, into old age. Okay. So the next person, Matteo Trotta, another a little interesting connection to Shrewsbury um, with Matteo. So uh, his death certificate, he died on October 10th. He was only 27 years old. His residence and, and was Edgewater Avenue, so down in, in um, the Edgewater section of town. He was born in Italy, uh, didn't have a, anything on his death certificate about family, about, um, but it did say the informant for the death certificate was Nicola Perna from Shrewsbury. So I did a little bit of research and Nicola, Nicola or Nicholas um, <coughs> lived, according to 1918 Shrewsbury directory, he, um, he lived um, on Edgewater with his wife Mary and uh, he was a soda maker. So that was, you know, that was the connection here, Edgewater. I happened to bump into um, Mike Perna at Veterans Day, and I mentioned this to him, and it turns out Nicola is his grandfather. So, so he's now off doing some research to figure out what that connection was. Um, but, he, but this was, was the house where his grandfather lived. A little bit more uh, about Ni Nicola, um, information I found that I'm... Um, I'm, I'm pretty confident is, is associated with him. He arrived in Boston on, from Naples at age 21 in 1911. His last resident, residence was recorded as Mont, um, Mont, Mount St. Angelo in Italy. And uh, he, uh, he was registered for the draft on, uh, in 1917. I got to figure out how to do this. I'm, I'm operating two computers here to get my notes. Um, oh, and, and he, when he registered for the draft, his occupation at that time was recorded as a blacksmith. He worked for Blakesley and Sons Company uh, on the Lake Bridge. So uh, Matteo was here, productive, came over, you would assume, for better life, better opportunity. Unfortunately, a victim of influenza. Alice May Rich. Now, Alice May, she's the one, that's the grave marker that got me into this, why I'm here this evening. So I think she's looking down, um, happy to be remembered perhaps, but she started this whole thing. She died on October 11th, 1918. She was only 22. She was a registered nurse. Uh, and, uh, and I learned tonight, talking um, to Linda, that she actually had, um, she had been at Devon's. So again, likely that's it. That's where she contracted. That's where she got the the virus. Um, her father was Cassius Rich. He was a veterinarian here in town. They lived on Grafton Street. Um, this you can see here. Um, this article, October seventh. So before she died, does reference her right here. Um, she was seriously ill with pneumonia, as well as several other people in in Shrewsbury. And then this brief description um, on uh, October 16th that her funeral had been held from the home on Grafton Street uh, and the pastor from the Congregational Church had, uh, had officiated. So I think the, um, the, the, the city directory, they called it the city directory, the, the Shrewsbury directory at the time uh, said the house was located at Grafton near Wesleyan and uh, I believe it was 102 Grafton Street is, is probably where she lived. Um, Samuel Leonard um, died on uh, 12, October 12th, and I'll just point out, if I go back just a bit, you'll note that um, Edward Piper was the second, but now there's October 10th, October 11th, October 12th. There's a series of someone was dying every day through October. Um, he was 22. He has lived on North Quinsigamond Avenue, though he died at Worcester City Hospital. His place of birth, birth was recorded as Russia. His parents were Jacob and Sarah, and he was a manager. So uh, doing a little bit of research on, on him in the 1918 uh, directory, 
He was listed as a manager at the Up to Date Waste, W A I S T, company that was located on Main Street in Worcester. He was living with his mother, Sarah. She was a widow. She was the widow of Jacob. Uh, and they lived at Cottage Avenue near North Quinsigamon. Right? So if you get out your map or you, you know that area, uh, that, that was the area where Samuel was. And he was buried uh, at the uh, Worcester Hebrew Cemetery in Auburn. Thanks. Okay. So I, gotta, I just got it. It's 30 minutes. I'm going to start to move quick. So. Um, and uh, Julia Bascia, if you're Italian, please forgive me if I'm mispronouncing these names, but she was one of the youngest victims. She died on October 13th. Not a lot of information about her on the death certificate, um, and I wasn't able to find a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of information on her. Her parents may have lived on Pine Hill Road uh, in 1918, um, but unfortunately, uh, I don't know a lot about Julia, but only five years old. Frederick Millens Wilder died on f October 14th. He was 20. Again, you're seeing it's, it's, it's taken the young people. May, he um, uh, died at home on Main Street. He's buried in Mountain View. Um, he was a, um, a chemical. He worked in the chemistry department at Brewer Company. It was a druggist or manufacturer, pharmacist, pharmaceutical manufacturer. Um, things about, uh, about him. Uh, the city directory, he lived at Main Street near South. His father, Fred, was an auto repairer. Uh, and um, he, you know, he was single at, at the time of death. Georgie Keck, she was Georgie Bailey Keck, died on October 18th, 36. Uh, she lived on South Street. She's also buried in Mountain View Cemetery. She was married to Charles. They had one son born in 1915, so another family with um, uh, young children, a young son left without, um, without a mother. Um, a little bit about her, uh, she, she died from pneumonia. She'd been ill only a week. She suffered a relapse early, uh, and the end came rapidly. So again, this was very cruel. This, this virus, um, people would be sick, and they would seem to be recovering. They think they were out of it, and then there would be a relapse, and they would suddenly die. So uh, it just was was a, a just a very cruel strain. And again, here, just talking, she uh, she she sang. She was a soprano soloist, soloist. A quartet sang at her funeral, and um, you know, an, I think another loss, you know, great loss to the community. I'll also note down here. There's a note about Arthur Holland of Holman Street, who was seriously ill with pneumonia first de developed as influenza. We're going to see him in a, in a minute. So, um, Rosina Vanottini. Unfortunately, again, I could not find anything on Rosina or Rosie or, or any variation of this name. If anybody knows her out there, or I, I would love to, f to, to get some info. She died on October 21st, uh, 22nd. She was only 21. She, her place of birth was Italy. She was married to Francesco. I think the difficulty in sometimes finding it is that the names were, um, were not spelled consistently or, or Americanized. Um, but, you know, tonight we remember um, Rosina Valentino. So October 24th, Arthur, Arthur Holland. Okay? Um, he was 29, lived on Holman Street. He was married to Winifred M Murray just in or Maury in August 1915. They had two children, um, so he had two very young children that he left. He was a market gardener. Um, oops. Um, this article, drip, Grip Comes Back, you know, Grip is the flu in Shrewsbury. So you note, um, they thought they had, quote, stamped it out. So they had that series of, of five or six people in a row, and then there was a gap, and they thought, good, we've, we've gotten through this. But then again, all of a sudden, People started um, started coming down with it again, um, and um, he he was a graduate of um, Shrewsbury High School and the Amherst Agricultural College. Right? He had graduated and uh, was in, again market gardening, and he was planning to take over the business from his father um, here in Shrewsbury. Um, another note down here about the library: um, you see Miss Mabel Knowlton. She was the librarian. She was ill at home with the flu. And this is interesting. The public library was opened last night, which October 23rd, um, to receive books, but you couldn't take any books out because they were fumigating 
the entire library in the books. So I, th I think they thought, well, the librarian got sick. They didn't know what to do. They were trying everything and everything to, to sort of stem uh, the spread of this disease. Uh, Gr Grazia Lamanuzzi, okay, probably Grace, she died on October 25th, 26 years old, Worcester City Hospital. Again, she, she was um, from Italy. Um, the death certificate recorded she was married to uh, Domenico. They, um, I, a little research, I believe they had three children, again, very young. Um, and not, again, not, couldn't find a whole lot about her. I will note it, another very sad story. Uh, she, uh, the death certificate says a contributory cause of death was pneumonia, which is common, and then miscarriage for months. Oh. So I suspect she probably was expecting another child. So th these families lived through some, some very difficult s stories. Charles Francis Sanderson, October 30th. So he's the last one in October. Okay. Um, he lived on West Main Street. He was married to Ruth Parkhurst. They had one son who was born about 1916. He was a chauffeur. And what I, what I learned about him um, was that uh, he lived with, um, he boarded with Arthur K. Hutchins, who lived on Main Street. And this, this article I found um, was, it was very bad to begin with, and so it didn't blow up very well. But Basically what it says is it confirms he was a chauffeur for um, Arthur Hutchins and it says that um, he had contacted influenza and on the advice of his physician he went to the hospital, which probably was the worst place to go, um, where pneumonia developed. Um, so Charles Sanderson, um, you know, um, been died um, unfortunately the last one in October. As I had said before, there were none in November. And then here's a name I think everybody knows. I didn't know this before I, I did this. Um, but December comes the word that Raymond Stone had died. Uh, so people um, may be familiar with the name. I know you guys all are. Uh, but certainly the Ray, Ray Stone um, American Legion post was named in honor of Ray Stone. He was 29. His residence was Main Street, but he died in Texas at Rich Field because he was a soldier. He was Sergeant First Class Aero Service. Before enlisting, he was a carpenter. His parents, I, I believe both born in Shrews Shrewsbury, certainly the Stone family has a long history here in Shrewsbury. He, um, he actually had two death certificates, one in Shrewsbury and one in Texas. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, he, he just was... Um, by all accounts, um, just a well-liked, active citizen in the community. He, he was involved in, in um, civic um, activities. He was, this article um, points out um, that he wrote home and he was, they said, chafed. He was irritated that they wouldn't send him to France to fight. But he really wanted to go, but they felt they needed his skills here in the United States. And that's probably why he ended up in, in Texas. He had been to flight school. Uh, again, he was known as an excellent carpenter. Um, and then right down here, uh, just a, it's a, again sad but interesting, the night before he died, his parents received a telegram telling him that he was seriously ill of pneumonia. So his father and his brother headed out to Texas. Um, and unfortunately, they'd only gotten to this, according to this article, to New York before the word came that Raymond had died. Um, it goes on to say that they had left directions for the family on how to reach them in case word was received before they got to Texas, uh, that they would arrive in St. Louis and, and the family would know how to contact them. So, you know, again, no cell phones, no way to get to people. They took off on this mission and unfortunately um, they didn't make it. It also says at the last sentence, the body will be, um, they were hope they, were, they didn't know at this point it was probable that the, the father or the brother might continue on to Texas to bring him home. But the death certificate in Shrewsbury noted that the body was accompanied home by a Sergeant um, Lewis uh, Rafus from the military. So, uh, so I don't know if the, if the family made it there or, or they eventually turned around, but he did get a military um, return to, to Shrewsbury and burial. And so he's, he's, as we know, he's over at Mountain View. Um, 
quickly. Uh, then December 20th, Jenny Morse Horton. She was 21, uh, Pleasant Avenue. She was born in Nova Scotia, married to George. Three young children again um, of note here. Very sad. Um, her last child was born December 16th. She died December 20th. And I noted on the death certificate that, uh, that she had, um, the female doctor had actually signed her death certificates, the only one I saw. Very unusual at that time. And I suspect that's because she was treating her for delivery of, of the baby. It was um, Hannah Simmons, who was a, a physician in uh, Worcester at the time. Now we're into 1919. I'm going to go really quick here. January, 22-year-old um, Lillian Jolin died. She lived on Spring Street. She's buried at Mountain View. She worked at the Royal Worcester Corset Company. Um, some little facts about, um, about Lillian. That, uh, so her, 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 in 1910, the census, she was living with her, mo her mother, Malvina, you see on here. Okay. Uh, Malvina was a widow with, with uh, two young children in 1910. Uh, and then uh, in 1918, she lost her, her daughter, Lillian. Uh, and up here, um, you know, again, they're just talking how she had been dangerously ill. She had developed spinal meningitis. So again, just, um, okay. Esther Roberts died in February 19th. Now she breaks the mold here in terms of age. I included a few people on here because they fit that this really went into the early months of 1919 and they died from influenza, but, but they, they weren't the, um, the, the, the younger people, if you will. She was married to Blaine or Belaney Roberts. They had three daughters. And her husband, Blaine, was this, the CEO, the president, the owner of Roberts and Company. They made sausages and, and provisions, meats and stuff like that in Worcester. After she died, um, he moved with his three children to uh, South Quinsigamond Avenue. Um, Harriet Newhall, again, she was 79, but she did die from influenza in that period. She was the widow of George. She's buried over at Mountain View. Um, this talks a little bit about her, um, her funeral that afternoon at home. Interesting about Harriet, um, George, her husband, um, worked for the Boston and Worcester Street Railway. So those were the streetcars that went between Worcester and Boston. We know that ran through Shrewsbury. And uh, the 1918 directory notes that where they lived on Grafton Street was near the B&W Street Railway. So I suspect um, they lived there because of his work. The youngest victim that I identified was Joseph Scavas, who died, he was only one years old, February 1919. Uh, residence was Phillips Avenue. Again, not a lot I could find. His parents were born in Lithuania. Um, there was, in 1918, a Joseph Scaris that lived off his Phillips Avenue, so I suspect that's them. And in 1920, uh, Joseph and his wife Nellie, which could be a version of Elena, uh, were living with two children. Um, on um, Lakeview Avenue in Shrewsbury. Congetta D'Alessandro, she died in March 1919. She was 60. She is buried with a marker at Mountain View. Uh, she was born in Italy, married to uh, Leopoldo, Le Leo. And um, again, I couldn't find a whole lot about her. Um, other than 1918, Leo, he was a painter and he lived with Congetta at is described as Turnpike near Baker Avenue. So that's a little bit about her. All right. And finally, George Edward Stone. George Stone was the town clerk. So in what is perhaps the final irony, if you will, of this whole thing is that the last ones to, to die from influenza in Shrewsbury was the town clerk. Also, I believe at one time he was the president of the Shrewsbury Historical Society, maybe around 1901, I believe. Um, George actually, you know, he signed all those death certificates, or most of them. He recorded them. He's the one that reported in the annual report, and then eventually um, he, succum he su succumbed to the influenza virus. Um, this, this here is, is reporting that he was ill at home with, with the flu, the grip, a nurse was attending him. That was on March 20th, and he died on March 23rd. And then this article just describes, you know, 
his service to the town, um, how dedicated he was to the community. Uh, just a very big, a very sad loss. He was married to Emma Davis. I believe they only had one child. He was born in Shrewsbury. Um, yes, and one of the reasons I don't mention the names of, of the children, unless you see them in the articles, is because some of these people might still be alive, right? You know, I mean, they, they'd be elderly, but they could be alive. So I've, I've chosen not to do it, but I, but I hear the, uh, some recognition there. He was, um, his father was, a, again, a stone, Josiah Stone. Um, and a fact, uh, let's see, let me go over here. Um, oh, I keep forgetting, I gotta hit two things here. Um, the 1919 uh, town clerk's report was dedicated to him. There's a memoriam in there talking about his service uh, for the community, uh, all that he did, uh, he, he, his record, his documentation. Um, his, um, the connection here that's, that's, I guess, interesting and very sad is his, um, his brother was Henry Stone, father of Ray Stone. So he was Ray Stone's uncle, right? Um, so again, uh, you can only imagine the families um, affected, uh, you know, multiple members of the family affected by this. So summarizing 1919 and, um, and this period, this is from, again, the town clerk's report. Uh, it was a period they'd been through World War I. Um, they thought World War I, they, it was, it was done in November. They thought they were coming out of the woods, but they were dealing with this flu pandemic. They had just come through a lot, these people. But they're still, at the end of 1919, you see in the report, you see optimism. Um, many comments that could be Shrewsbury today. The town is growing, new voters are being added to the list, high cost of building materials, new houses, they just built a schoolhouse. This could be today. Um, you know, they're talking about uh, electric lights and, and improvements. Um, up the top, the July 4th, they had a big celebration. You can just imagine what that was like in 1919, um, you know, honoring the men who served and the men who didn't come back. They, they mentioned it was a day of bell ringing and cannon firing, um, you know, evening activities. And then finally, the town report summarizes that in November, the first meeting was held of the former war ser service men. And it was at that meeting they decided to form the Raystone Post. The charter was applied for at that point, and, uh, and that was their way of, of honoring um, one of their own here from Shrewsbury who, who died. So. Hopefully that leaves you all on a, um, a more positive note. Um, I know that wasn't the most uplifting. I find it a fascinating point in history. I hope it's brought some of the people, um, made a more personal touch so we remember them. Uh, and, uh, and I'd be happy if anybody's got any questions, you're probably all like, oh gosh, let me run out of here. Um, <laughs> if any questions, uh, you know, I'd be happy to, um, to answer them. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, okay. There you go. I'm sure a lot of people, you know, you may have people who died in that time period, you might not even realize um, that that's what it was. Or if, if they died from pneumonia, you might not again realize that it was actually influenza. Yep. I remember about 40 years ago, two great aunts of mine taking me to the family burial plots. I was putting people there and pointing out a couple of young children and telling me there was a dreadful flu mm. and they didn't have antibiotics. Yep, yep. Yeah, it was, I mean, it's just on a number of levels, as, as you've heard, it was just, uh, it was just heartbreaking. Uh, you know, young people uh, affected children, f children, so many children left without parents or, or sick. Uh, it just, uh, on a number of levels, uh, you know, just, you can understand why it, it was described, you know, it was a pandemic, but it was just a, it, it couldn't come at any good point in history, but it was a horrible point in terms of, of World War I. Again, they think World War I, the conditions at the end of the war contributed, you know, to, to the virus, uh, you know, maybe to it mutating as it did. Uh, and also, you know, I think a little further research, if, if I were doing it, would be to understand why officials, um, uh, th there, is, um, there is some indication that they, they were given a warning by medical uh, researchers that there would be some kind of an epidemic. They expect something was, 
was going to come from the war, um, but, uh, but uh, it, it seemed that there hadn't been any preparation or planning for it. Mm. Yeah, Henry? Uh, my mother um, had the that flu during 1918 or 19, lived in Tennessee, ah. and recovered. But it's very interesting that supposedly people, a lot of the people that got this flu later on had Alzheimer's disease. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. Died of Alzheimer's disease. Oh. Really? Yes, and that was the story was that quite a few people, that's what happened to them. Yep. You know, uh, 60 years later. Yeah, 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 yeah. I get it. That'd be a great research project. Uh, you know, that's how I look at these things. <laughs> great research project. It's a sad thing, but it's, it's interesting to understand because, you know, these pandemics, as we've seen, they come around occasionally. You know, hopefully now we have antibiotics we're prepared but you know you don't know and and those are interesting uh, links I think to make yep ma'am oh sorry uh, my father Ooh. was at Camp Devon he being a farmer uh, was chosen to be a wagoneer every I guess they called them mule skinners in the service <laughs> and he said that his duty was a six mules on a wagon and the start was loading mu munitions because everybody was going to France. Mm -hmm. And he said, the sad thing is I ended doing nothing but loading bodies from the house. Yes, yeah. Oh, so he uh, actually had that experience. Wow, wow. I, I must have, uh, something he carried with him his whole life, I'm sure. And they described that, you know, again, 8,000 people, you know, um, they, they just were, right, carting people away. They didn't have time. They, in, in some communities, I think it was Webster, there was a, there was a news report that they, they didn't have enough coffins to bury people. I mean, these are tiny towns, if you think about it at the time, um, uh, and they didn't have I'm enough. I was going to tell you that even here in Shrewsbury they were having that because after Alice died, mm -hmm. So that explains why, right, um, yeah. that, that our reference. Yeah, they couldn't yep. take caskets or coffins or anything yeah. in because yeah. there were so many deaths that yeah. there was nothing available. Wow. They were bringing them in from other states. And yeah. You just, yeah. Bernie? Uh, Moira, uh, first of all, thank you very much for your uh, excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Informative and enjoyable. Um, I have a uh, question, though. How did it get named Spanish flu? Did mm -hmm. they suspect that the origins were in Spain? They did. They did. Um, and there was there was a one. Uh, so again, there's some of the information the uh, conflicts as just to what, but that that it had um, when it when the virus was brought over there that it mutated. It combined with uh, I think it was a swine flu at the time, uh, and that 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 developed in that region. And that's where Spanish flu uh, came from. Yeah. yeah. So, yep. This certainly isn't important, but if you remember the show upstairs, downstairs. Yeah. Yeah. One of the girls had influenza. I can't remember if she survived. Or yeah. Not, yeah. But I remember her having it. Well, more recently, Downton Abbey. If you're Downton Abbey fans, um, that that um, the mother uh, in Downton Abbey had it, uh, and uh, and she survived it. But but again, they they illustrated in that uh, how it she got it. Uh, they thought she was getting better. And I think this was Downton Abbey where that happened, and then she relapsed and got really sick. But of course, being Downton Abbey, <laughs> thankfully she survived <laughs> for another season. But um, but yeah yeah. It was just cruel. It was a cruel. I mean, not not that any virus is a nice thing, but it's just cruel on so many levels um, at, the, at that time period. That that in, that 1918 virus. Um, 